Matt, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back on. So, Matt, uh, we're going to talk about uh, Raspberry FUD or Raspberry Raspberry Pis, um, Bitcoin nodes, you know, and of course, you know, the latest with uh, you know what's going on with Start Nine. Uh, so, yeah, let's let's start um, with that. So, I guess. Uh, uh, you know, I like just to set the context for listeners. I had a recent episode with Katan where we spoke a little bit about Raspberry Pis, and uh, I think Katan and I were, let's say, sharing some of our experiences where we've had issues with our Raspberry Pis. Um, but I, I wanted to, you know, g- give you a chance to chat about your your views on this, also, Matt. So, do you want to, um, you know, just give us your, I guess, high level thoughts on on that topic? Yeah, absolutely. So after that episode, you know, we have a pretty, pretty strong community and they all reached out being like, Hey, <laughs> uh, what's up? So I, th- I thought it was pretty cool to, you know, be able to get on here and, uh, talk about it in order to, um, answer some of their questions as well as some others, uh, which I'm sure other communities have as well, because the Raspberry Pi has essentially come to dominate, uh, Bitcoin and lightning home node operatorship. Um, and so with an episode coming out, that's like, Hey, this thing's no good anymore. Obviously there's going to be a lot of feathers rustled. Um, and so, yeah, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that, you know, adding some context and, um, uh, providing some, some advice going forward, uh, is warranted. So, um, now you guys did a great job of that as well. Uh, actually Catan did a wonderful, uh, job. I thought his analysis was, very thorough um, and not inaccurate um, in any meaningful sense, um, and you know maybe uh, lacking a little bit of context from sort of what our community is expecting. So that's the main reason I'm I'm here now. Um, so to answer your question directly, now that I've sort of set the stage uh, as to how this even came about and why, um, you know the Raspberry Pi, uh, as was mentioned in your initial uh, broadcast with Catan. Um, was designed as a, as a low priced, you know, computer board for children to learn on, um, and it got really good, right? It became a very powerful uh, entry level computing device. Um, powerful compared to you know, say, other super cheap single board computers. Um, it actually became quite performant over the years, enough so that you could run a Bitcoin full node on it. And as a, as a show of, you know, um, as a demonstration or, or uh, of, of, you know, the, the limited resource needs of Bitcoin and Lightning as well, it's like, hey, you can run these things on a little Raspberry Pi. Anyone can do this. They're available all over the world. They're super cheap. Um, and very few other systems, uh, you know, sort of blockchain cryptocurrency style systems uh, could possibly run on a little Raspberry Pi. Uh, And that was a testament to Bitcoin's um, engineering uh, feat that it had achieved. Um, And as you discussed, it's starting to now kind of get bigger, right? Not just Bitcoin itself in terms of the size of the blockchain. It's actually gotten more efficient uh, in terms of RAM and compute needs, uh, the the storage needs are bigger if you are running a full archival node. If you are running a pruned node, then Bitcoin is actually more runnable on a Raspberry Pi today than it has ever been uh, before. Um, And if you have a, you know, two terabyte SSD, then it's also just as if not more runnable on a Raspberry Pi today than it ever has before. Where things start to get tough is the, the dependent services, right? Things like ElectRS, um, you know, things like uh, Lightning, and then layer three services that are using the Lightning nodes, like they can really start to add up. And then that can start to put stress on this, you know, little Raspberry Pi. It has nothing to do with Bitcoin, uh, essentially. It has to do with the ecosystem that is exploding around Bitcoin and that people want to do with their Bitcoin nodes that can start to make the Raspberry Pi uh, a bit you know, inadequate. Um, so where does it start to become inadequate, right? It's not RAM. Um, that is not the first place that we see bit, uh, the Raspberry Pi start to break down. Eight gigabytes of RAM is pretty good, right? So I have a little old Embassy One running here that I've been running for two and a half years, and it's an, uh, you know, Pi 4, eight gigabyte um, variety. And I have 25 services running in parallel on it, and I'm using about 70% of my RAM uh, on any given moment. Now, during times of sync, 
it gets a lot worse, right? So if you're syncing Bitcoin from Genesis and you're syncing ElectRS and you're syncing the NBX Explorer from BTC Pay and you're doing all these at the same time, you're going to you're going to bog it down. Um, but actually, RAM might not even be the first place that that happens. It's going to be the CPU, right? So the Pi, that is the biggest shortcoming of the Pi, is actually the chip. Um, it is pretty low powered and some of the Bitcoin services, uh, Bitcoin and related services can really get CPU hungry uh, at times. And so if you are trying to do a lot of syncing at the same time, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, like we tell our community members, you know, when you first spin up your embassy, don't install 20 things and turn them all on right at the exact same moment. The operating system just isn't sophisticated enough yet to protect you from yourself in those circumstances, right? On even a normal computer, if you were to crank up 40 things at the same time and try to sync them all, and when I say normal computer, I mean something much more powerful, you're still going to notice a significant performance uh, drop off, if not total throttling. Um, so, you know, it there's a little bit of user discretion involved into making these things uh, work as expected. I'm going to turn off my notifications here, otherwise it's going to get very loud very quickly. Yep, all good. Yeah. Um, also, well, actually, I'll, let you, I'll pause just there just for bit. a second. Yeah. Do you mind Sorry, turning your that? volume down just a little bit? I think it's clipping just a bit. Yeah, cool. just yeah, just a bit. Yeah, but yeah. So that's um. Look, I think uh, f fair points as well. I think that's i think that's been part of the story of the the history of the the raspberry pi bitcoin node it became almost like a meme it became and it became a thing in the community and i'm not denying that and i obviously i've, I've promoted that in the past myself um i think the other question that probably comes up is around cost today the cost today to buy a raspberry pi compared to the cost let's say pre you know, if we went back, if we rewind the clock two or three years, the cost to buy a Raspberry Pi might have been, it might have actually been more like $100, $150, right? Whereas if you're looking at it now, that cost has come up a lot. So I think that maybe that's also the point that, uh, you know, that people have to think about, what, whatever they're doing, whether whether they are doing their own, like whether they're buying a, a node off the shelf, whether they're doing their own thing, uh, maybe that's, that's where the conversation is. Maybe it's kind of like Raspberry Pi's, you know, if you're buying a new device, right? So let's say if you already have your device and it's already working and you already don't have any issues with it, well, hey, no issues, right? No harm, no foul. You're all good. I think maybe the the question then is more about what's the what's the story going forward, or what should we do if you are advising somebody today who's like, hey, Matt, I want to run a Bitcoin node. What what are my options? Yep. So when the Raspberry Pi shortage kicked in, uh, we had to really look at ourselves. I mean, this was what probably a year and a half ago it was the first time we started to witness some shortages. Um, you know, we were lucky because we're buying in bulk and because we kept inventory and because we have some good suppliers, um, and because we're aggressive, we have always been able to get our hands on, you know, baseline price raspberry pies. We are, have been, and continue to buy the eight gigabyte varieties at $75 a piece. It's how we've been able to keep our prices of the lower end device reasonable while still maintaining something of a margin for ourselves so we can do business. Um, but we immediately were just like, this is a single point of failure. There's no way that we're going to build a successful company around a supply chain like this that can be disrupted. Plus, it's unnecessary because there's lots of computers that can run uh, you know, all the services that we're looking to run. So we um, began looking at other options. And so we're actually quite familiar with some of the other options out there, right? We went to the Rock Pro 64 first, uh, you know, this other single board computer variety that has a little bit more power. And we found out that we were going to have to do a lot of customization, right? We were going to have to build our own encasements. We were, like there wasn't a big ecosystem built out around that single board computer, uh, not as much as the Raspberry Pi. Um, and then so we started looking at more traditional things, right? Like even some of these mini PC options, which ultimately is where we've landed. So as a company, what we have done now is we've created two distinct products. We have like the lower level entry level product, which um, I can get into specifics in terms of how we recommend usage and what we recommend using them for, which is still based on the pie at present, but does so in a way that alleviates many of the shortcomings of the pie, uh, which first and foremost, I should have mentioned earlier, the biggest problem with the pie by far is power. The pie is notoriously bad at uh, power usage, as in it doesn't 
it doesn't supply it very well. Um, and so if you're running an external SSD plugged into the USB 3 port and you have a, you know, uh, normal stock Raspberry Pi power supply, you're going to have issues. We've seen these issues. We had, we learned them the hard way, actually. We, we had to do some replacements for people because it's like, it took us a minute to figure out what was going on. And what was happening was like voltage leaks. We, we just weren't supplying enough power. And it's like your home power mattered. Like if your house had any kind of like uh, lower levels of power or power fluctuations, all of a sudden these ghost-like, you know, database issues were popping up. We were just like, wow. So the Raspberry Pi just isn't very good at delivering power to these external drives. Um, and so what we have done with the embassy one, the new embassy one, is we've gone for an all-in-one enclosure. So it is a very small all-in-one enclosed device where the SSD is actually inside of the box with the Pi and the encasement has its own added power supply. So we've solved both the dangling cord external USB issue as well as the shortcomings of the Raspberry Pi when it comes to power. And that is our new offering. And that is the only thing that we now recommend and support. So even our DIY guide, this is all happening like right now, right? So that's why this was so timely. Your conversation with Katana was just like, yes, yes, that's, <laughs> that's exactly why we're making the changes that we're making is because the old recommendation of get a Pi, put it in a box, get an external SSD with an enclosure, plug it in, and then use it for 25 things in parallel just is causing problems. People are having a bad time with this. So the all-in-one enclosure with its own power supply alleviates all of the issues with the Pi, save for one, which is the low CPU. So we recommend that if you're going to go with the one, use it for your non-heavy things, right? And this can dovetails into a conversation about bifurcation of services as well, like Bitcoin, non-Bitcoin. Is that even a proper bifurcation? But we recommend the one now and we say, look, if you want to use it to run Bitcoin and Lightning, you absolutely can. Just don't sync everything at once. Once they're all synced, it's gonna be smooth sailing. We have years of data to prove that the Pi 4 8 gigabyte can provide smooth sailing on probably about 15 parallelized services running Bitcoin stuff. Or we say, use your Embassy One to do all your non-heavy stuff. And then the Pi is a breeze. You can run Vault Warden and Nextcloud and all of these you know, messaging applications and services on a Raspberry Pi, and it doesn't even touch the, the CPU and the RAM. It's perfectly adequate for that stuff. Elect RS is really the beast in the room that's making this right. conversation a lot more interesting. Right. I think that's like the elephant in the room, stuff. right? And so for listeners yeah. who aren't familiar, Elect RS refers to Electrum Rust server. And so the idea is when we run our Bitcoin node, we can think of the elect RS, it does this address indexing function. And so when we run our wallet, so for example, Sparrow wallet or Electrum wallet on the computer, that connects to our node and that's normally talking to the Electrum server. So that's the, uh, the it adds hard drive usage. It, it has a lot more CPU. So as you rightly point out, I think that's probably the elephant in the room. Um, although I wonder, I'm curious, uh, how much does adding lightning um, add to things like, let's say if you have a lot of channels going, does that add a lot? No, um, not comparatively. Uh, if you're running a Bitcoin node and an LND node and so on embassy, we offer, you know, LND and CLN. I run them both on the same box. Um, they don't touch the system resources, not in the same way that elect RS does. Um, and again, during initial sync, they're going to use a lot more. And if you have a ton of channels, they're going to use a lot more, but if you are a power routing node, like if you're a serious lightning node operator and you have tons of channels, because look, the average person running a lightning node, if you're using it to pay and get paid on the lightning network, you only need like three good channels, right? Find a couple well-connected peers, open sizable channels, make sure they have inbound and outbound liquidity, and you're going to be able to pay anyone anywhere. You only need two to three channels. If you're running... 20, 30, hundreds of channels, you're not using a Raspberry Pi with an SSD. Otherwise, you're just, you don't get it. Like you need a serious machine, um, which is where our new product comes into play, right? Where it doesn't have to just be for power lightning node users. It's also for the Uncle Jim model, for content creators who want to reach tens of thousands of people. Um, you need a serious computer. And so that's our other product that we are now offering, which is the Embassy Pro. Now, the Embassy Pro is a 32 gigabyte, two terabyte NVMe 
Um, it's got a Intel i7 4.9 gigahertz processor with Intel management engine disabled in firmware, which is the only device um, that can claim that. Uh, running um, anything on Intel is sort of inherently backdoored. Okay, Intel management engine, which exists beneath the operating system, is sort of a built-in backdoor, um, and it's just a known vulnerability that people have learned to live with. Uh, our hardware partner that we got with to manufacture the Pro, uh, Purism, um, they make Pure OS, which has a brute boot process that actually disables Intel management engine underneath the operating system. So it is totally private, not backdoored at least not by that. If there's something lower we don't know about, nobody knows about, then whatever. But we we can claim that the one known vulnerability um, has been disabled in the Pro. So anyway, it's it's a rocket ship of a computer. Um, it's built on an x86 architecture with an Intel i7 chip. Um, it will satisfy you to do pretty much whatever you want. Um, you, can, you can run probably 50, 60 services in parallel. We don't even offer that many on our marketplace yet. Um, while also serving as Uncle Jim for your friends and family, while also serving your um, community, you know, followers with blog posts and stuff like that, um, hosting your own website. So it is a serious professional tool or just for somebody who needs the biggest, baddest, latest thing. Um, and then the lower end, again, is still the pie, which we think is OK, so long as you understand the the sort of limitation of how much you can do with it at the same time. That's really the the big caveat, the asterisk of of the lower end embassies Vices, or guys yeah. in general. It's just like don't run twenty, don't sync twenty things at the same time on it. That's the, sure. the big asterisk. That's yeah. it. One other point, probably just to clarify on that as well, is some users with Raspberry Pis have commented publicly, and we've seen people talk about this kind of thing around their SD card getting corrupted. So I'm curious if you have an experience on that. Now I've seen different comments on that. So for example, Wiz of mempool.space he's spoken about this idea where again there's people using different approaches one approach he's mentioned is this idea that that sd card should just be like a read only thing and then that's how you can help uh lower the risk of that sd card getting corrupted and so the idea is you're using the ssd to do most of the actual work which can deal with more read and write i'm curious what your view is on that and how, how the start nine team are, are thinking about this question that's exactly how we think about it. Our our SD card uh, is a read only thing. I shouldn't say that it stores a little bit of metadata about the SSD, just so that it sort of knows who its parent is. Like if, for instance, you were to take out your SSD and put in somebody else's SSD, it's going to boot into diagnostic mode and be like, something's weird here. You've swapped data on me. So it sort of knows who its SSD is. But other than that, the the card itself strictly holds the operating system and then has a fully uh, empty partition that is designed for holding another operating system, another copy of Embassy OS, because we do these deployments, uh, these red green deployments like that. So for instance, when you update your embassy, what you're doing is say like you're on 031 and you're downloading 032, it downloads 032 to the SD card. And then on next boot, it just switches over. And then it actually keeps a full copy of 031 in case you, there's some sort of emergency rollback necessary, which we don't expect and have never had, but it has both both the old and the new copy of Embassy OS on the SD card. So it's not read only, but it is OS only, meaning if it became corrupt or you just took it out and snapped it in half, nothing bad would happen. All you would have to do is go get another SD card, flash Embassy OS on it, plug it in, and two seconds later, you're back up and running right where you were. So the SD card is uh, no threat to our system. And if anyone is relying on the SD card as an essential part of their system, it's a mistake. Uh, we were doing that for the first year. Uh, we sort of knew we were doing it when we first launched, but we also knew that there was no, like the threat model was not there. There was nobody using our device. We were iterating and growing, but as usual, we identify our own shortcomings and try to fix them. Right. Yeah. And I understand maybe part of the trade-off was for people who, it depends what data they were storing on that SD card. And maybe for some reasons where if people wanted a certain level of, let's say, portability from one to another, maybe that was why they were using that SD card, let's say, more actively. Um, but I think it seems that the community has sort of settled on that idea of kind of relatively less rights to that SD card so that there's less risk around the corruption there and so that, you know, the user has a better time, let's say. Um, the best uh, thing is just yeah. not use it for anything important. <laughs> and then if it right. corrupts or it breaks, it doesn't matter. You just right. replace yeah. it. And so I think the broader question as well, and so I guess going to that broader, you know, you mentioned the IME, the Intel Management Engine. And so as you said, this is like one of those well-known vulnerabilities that people talk about in 
let's say FOSS and FOSH, you know, free open source hardware world. Um, and so there are various manufacturers, I know like Purism and uh, I think System76 and various others who try to do this idea where they're like saying, okay, we're trying to like mitigate that in some way or whatever, right? Um, so I think it also comes to like that question of like which architecture, right? So is, is it an ARM chip? Are we using like x86 um, uh, for our uh infrastructure and uh, i oh and i while we're here as well i think it might be interesting if you have any comment on let's say warren togami's views as well whereas warren has put out his view where he's saying uh one of the problems with some of these uh raspberry pi nodes in his view uh, is that they're not bringing the up to the security updates uh that are feasible on the full-blown level of linux and so that's why from his point of view he would rather people are using like the full-blown linux as opposed to like raspberry pi uh, uh, operating systems. Do you have any comment, or uh, do you have a comment on that? You know, I I, I get it. I um, I also think that from a threat model perspective, it's probably more on the margin. Um, you know, you want the latest software, but at the same time, doing automatic updates, for instance, to the latest thing all the time is actually a vulnerability too. So you're kind of, you know, like always staying up to date with the latest software can be dangerous. Um, and having software that doesn't get updated frequently enough can also be dangerous. Um, I, I would not be able to cite off the top of my head any sort of reason to believe that the Raspberry Pi Foundation does not, um, you know, stay up with security vulnerabilities in Raspberry Pi OS. Uh, it's possible that there's some precedent where, you know, a security vulnerability was discovered and they didn't release an update for four or five months. I'm not aware of an incident like that. Um, could it happen? Of course it could happen. It could happen to any distro. Um, you know, Embassy OS is based on Raspberry Pi OS for the one, and it's based on pure OS for the pro. And so it is up to us to make sure that we are keeping an eye on Raspberry Pi OS and pure OS and the underlying sort of Debian uh, and Linux kernel to make sure that those distros are staying up to date. Uh, if they're not, we have ways of, you know, getting in there and trying to, to, you know, patch them up as well. Um, but at the, at the same time, this is just sort of an inherent kind of challenge when it comes to software development is dependencies. It's like, what are you built on? Because nothing is built on binary, right? Like we're like six layers up in the stack uh, for most of these services and applications. Embassy OS is obviously much lower, but we're still built on like, you know, we're built on pure OS, which is built on Debian, which is built on the Linux kernel. And it's just like, it's just like software is a layered thing. So dependencies are always um, something you just have to keep an eye on and be diligent about. Sure. Um, and so on the question of cost as well, so can you just outline for listeners, what's the cost difference here? Let's say if we're going for the Embassy One, what's the cost of the Embassy Pro device, just to give people an idea? So the the Embassy One, we are literally in transition right now. So the Embassy One, we're, we have just transitioned from the like external drive plug and play thing to the all in one uh, encasement. We're actually lowering the cost as a result of this, but that is more of a uh, sort of company decision. Rather, it's not like our costs have gone down. We're just trying to keep the entry level device lower while we push the pro for more uh, advanced usage. So the cost, the new cost of the embassy one, don't quote me to the dollar on this, is going to be um, right around $500 for the one terabyte variety. Um, and that's before any kind of discount, which there's lots of discount codes floating around out there. We also have 8%, 7% on fold, by the way, too. So if you have a fold card, you can compound these discounts and basically just get free Bitcoin. And then the all in cost is in like the low 400s, plus you're stacking Bitcoin. So all in, if you take advantage of the right discount codes, uh, you're looking at low 400s for a one terabyte variety and low 500s for a two terabyte variety. And this is in an all-in-one enclosure. So again, power problems solved. It's a very nice device. Uh, the Embassy Pro, we're currently pre-selling because we haven't started shipping it yet. Uh, it is on track for a fall release. So in the next couple of months, we, we will be shipping this device. Um, we are taking deposits currently at $42 for a deposit, which then gets you a huge discount off of our expected retail price. Uh, we're still sort of feeling the market out on this, but we expect to retail the Embassy Pro uh, at between $1,800 and $1,900. If you're putting the 42 down, we're giving you $400 off of that price. 
So we're looking right around $1,400 to $1,500 uh, as your all-in cost for the Pro. Um, I know that sounds like a lot. If you were to go online and configure an Intel Nook to the exact specification of the Embassy Pro, it would be almost $2,000. So we are undercutting the market from a computer performance standpoint significantly by about 20 to 25%. Uh, these are real badass computers, right? Um, I would like to talk about some of the options that you and Catan talked about as well, which is going the like refurbished mini PC route to get more power on a budget, uh, which we think is wonderful and very viable as well. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, just to sort of give the listeners their kind of neutral and, you know, for them to understand, okay, if I'm buying the Start9 device, what am I paying for, right? It's not just the hardware. It's also that kind of the software support, you're supporting this project. And so there's like an aspect there. I, I appreciate that. Um, so let's talk then about the comparative, the comparisons for if people were to DIY, let's say DIY with, um, you know, if you went for a ThinkPad or if you went for, you know, Catan's, you know, Dell Optiplex, you know, a couple hundred dollars. Now, to be fair, that there is some more DIY required here. So for example, you might need to actually be comfortable with opening that box up, putting in a, a bigger hard drive. You might need to be comfortable with, depending on how you want to set it up, you might need to be comfortable with command line. You might need to flash Ubuntu and then let's say use um, a PC image. Um, so there's different uh, components to that. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts that you want to add there around you know, the comparison of DIY versus buy something out of the box. Yeah. Um, so we are sort of DIY first uh, in terms of our messaging. So like if you go to our website, there's you know buy an embassy and DIY side by side. Um, ultimately, we want to see this technology spread. We want to see people self-hosting. Um, you know, that's the point here. We sell convenience um, and support, right? We sell community. We sell. So when you buy from Start9, what you're doing is, is like we're developing arguably the most advanced kind of self-hosting uh, for for everyone technology that has ever existed. Um, and that doesn't come cheap, right? We're a talented team of people who who need to survive and and, you know, we're growing a business here. Uh, so that we can continue to propagate the technology. Now, that said, it's also not a donation, right? You are getting real value if you buy from us as opposed to DIY, um, which is the plug and play experience. You just close your eyes, plug it in, and it just works. Um, and you're also getting this sort of 24-7 white glove support from us and from our very passionate community of very technical people. Um, like you're going to have, you're going to get help. Um, so that said, people who do feel confident to sort of put this together themselves um, can do so and and save a few bucks. Um, it's probably not as much as you think. Um, the discount is not that steep once you tally all the all the added costs and time. Um, it it is there, but it is on the margin. So, for instance, uh, doing a kind of DIY refurbished mini PC like an Optiplex. Um, you know, if you find a good deal, if you find a good refurbished one that's in excellent condition, um, you're going to end up with, you know, probably an i5. Uh, so, you know, a, a great processor, something that's going to blow the Raspberry Pi chip out of the water. Um, it's also not going to be, you know, the i7 or i9 brand new thing. It's going to be something a little bit more moderate, but very, very adequate for most usage. Um, you are going to have to get some storage uh, if you don't have it already. Um, and that can get pricey depends, right? If you're doing a one or two terabyte variety. So like the embassy pro, for instance, is a two terabyte NVMe, which is a far cry from a one terabyte SSD. Those are very, very different price, uh, considerations, a one terabyte SSD. You can pick up for under a hundred dollars. Uh, a two terabyte NVMe is usually going to run you 300 if it's of any, uh, decent quality. And there's a very noticeable difference there. Not only is it double the amount of storage, but it's way faster, way faster. And when you have write intensive uh, things like ElectRS, you're going to notice a big difference with something like that. So I think all in, uh, Catan had cited a like $500 kind of price target, maybe 400 right? For getting right. like I think a he was speaking in, in, in AUD terms. So yeah, something like that. Yeah. Let's say about 400. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. 
I think it varies a lot depending on where you are and, and the deal you can find. But let's say you can pick up a good computer um, between the $400 and $500 range or something like $400 range, um, you know, versus buying a Raspberry Pi all in one, everything put together for a similar price. Um, which one do you do, right? I, it depends. It depends on if you're comfortable doing the DIY approach. It depends on if uh, you value the the community and support aspect of the product. But we we support it, right? If you want to go get a, a, a Dell Optiplex and and install Embassy OS on it, can't do it yet because we haven't launched the x86 distro of the operating system. But it's around the corner. Um, we will be able to support. Um, we you know hopefully pretty much every every architecture and form factor under the sun eventually. Um, that'll require a little bit of tweaking for different things. And, you know, the problem here too is just variance in hardware. Like you're not going to have a lot of issues with the board itself, like the chip you know, and the RAM, those are all going to be okay. But storage can be, can be really painful. Um, there's a lot of drives out there that don't conform to exact standards or claim that they do and then don't exactly, um, so you got to be careful. You could end up having IO issues with your drive if um, it's not one of the sort of like known supported uh, quality drives. Gotcha. Yeah. So I guess in this example, um, uh, the one because uh, Katana and I chat and uh, often he, he he's a fan of the uh, I think it's the Samsung QVO. So, for example, let's say you went for that and it was a two terabyte drive. I think uh, I was looking it up. I mean, at least for me in the UAE, I can get that for about $150-ish um, for, yeah. for a two terabyte Samsung QVO SSD, not the N NVMe, as you were saying. Sure. Um, so you'd have to be, again, be comfortable opening your computer, plugging that in. So, you know, that, that will require a little bit of DIY. And you know what? There might be some people for who they would rather just pay. They'd rather just pay, have somebody do it, ship it to them, they plug it in, and, and it's good. Um, I, I also, I'm curious, um, you mentioned, you know, in the DIY case, so let's say a Start9 user wants to DIY, are you selling like a license to use the operating system or what's the model around that? Not anymore. No. So we have recently uh, changed our approach to Embassy OS, um, actually as planned. Okay. So like a lot of the things that we do, we actually have kind of a vision of how we're going to evolve this company and it gets more and more open over time, not less and less. Cause when you're tiny, you need a little bit of protection. Uh, and then as you grow, you can sort of get, and this is opposite the way a lot of people view company growth. They view it as you get bigger, you sort of corrupt more and more. Uh, we have an idea of doing it a slightly different way, but anyway, so embassy OS, um, is, is now totally free. Uh, we, you know, at today you can go download, uh, the O three one, uh, which is the latest version. You can go download 031 from um, either GitHub or images.startline.com and you just type in XXXXXXX, eight of them as your product key and it'll just download a fresh image and then you can install that on a Raspberry Pi. So it is possible today to essentially get up and running fully with an embassy uh, without ever touching us or doing business with us. And we are going to continue that obviously into 032 which is on the eve of being launched, which is a big version for us because it removes product keys altogether. So now all images are created equal. You will be able to download it from our website, download it from GitHub, download it from your friend's self-hosted instance of NextCloud, wherever. You can just download Embassy OS, flash it, plug it in, run it, and you're up and running. So it is a you know totally free, um, free as in beer OS for the consumer now. We retain a non-commercial clause in the license that basically says at present start nine is the only entity that can profit from the distribution uh, of embassy os but again that's part of a strategy as well gotcha and so 0 0.3.2 is that also the addition where like along with releasing that is that where you're going to also have x86 support oh three three i gotcha okay is x86 Gotcha. So O three two was a sort of intermediate step to get rid of product keys. Um, it is a lot of under the hood performance tuning. So like we switched from using a SQLite database to a Postgres database because SQLite just just you know <laughs> we yeah it was just causing some some obscure issues from time to time. So we've we've really kind of beefed up the OS in O three two. Uh, as well as simplified it by removing a lot of the weird stuff we were doing with product keys and um, 
And then 033 is the x86 distro, which will follow pretty shortly. We're actually a good way into 033 already. Um, and we'll launch with the Pro. Fantastic. And so then just if you could walk us through that install experience, I presume it's going to be similar, like basically the user will use something like Bolina Etcher, they'll download, is that going to be like an ISO file? They'll flash that either to the SD card or to a USB stick and then install it that way? Or what's the install look like? Exactly. You would you would download uh, Embassy OS um, to your computer. You would put in, you know, your your SD card, open up Belena Etcher, flash it, take the SD card out, put it in your Raspberry Pi, plug in an SSD, plug it into the wall, uh, you know, an Ethernet, and then visit embassy.local. It's a pretty standard setup procedure for these for these products. Um, and for good reason. It's very simple. Um, it's all done over the local area network of your home, right? Uh, the embassy is broadcasting on embassy.local. So it's just a web page. You just go to embassy.local and, you know, about three clicks later, uh, your device is up and running, serves itself on both the local area network in perpetuity on a unique address, by the way, it doesn't stay at embassy.local because if you had like multiple embassies, those would conflict with each other. Um, so it serves itself up on a unique dot local address and a unique dot onion address. So when you're home, you use it over HTTPS dot local, uh, and it has a self-signed cert that you install into your browser. So it's encrypted traffic, even on the LAN. So if somebody was, you know, uh, sniffing your LAN, they couldn't even see what you were doing. Uh, and then when you're on the go, you visit your onion address, which is also, you know, obviously encrypted and onion routed, uh, for remote access. What's really cool is that shortly following the release of the pro, our next major, um, feature launch is going to be ClearNet support. So you will be able to optionally, you will not have to do this, but it will be probably the best way to use your device. Um, you will optionally be able to add any domain uh, that you that you own uh, and use it to host your embassy, not only like the main dashboard of your embassy on say, you know, stefanlavera.com would be like your embassy main dashboard if you wanted it to be, and then btcpay.stefanlavera.com or store.stefanlavera.com would actually serve your BTC Pay store. And then you could do, you know, nextcloud.stefanlavera, and that would serve your own self-hosted Nextcloud instance. And so you can optionally, you will optionally be able to toggle on and off um, what domains slash subdomains you use for various services. And these will be highly granularly configurable. So for instance, you'll be able to register like four different domains, stefanlavera.com, stefanlavera.net, and then pick and choose which services you host on those domains and subdomains of those domains, uh, and then turn them on and off. So if you think that one like, you know, is being abused, like somebody's trying to DOS you on ClearNet, you can just go turn it off and that will stop. And your Tor address will remain. So censorship resistance is like a big deal here because it's like you can go full clear net, but if they ever pull the plug on you, you're two seconds later telling everyone to go to the onion site. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. And that could be handy as well for the, let's say the uncle Jim context, right? So let's say you oh, have yeah. Nextcloud and you have your uncle or your auntie who you want to share a photo with, or you can put that into your Nextcloud. And in that example, it could be, you know, in that Nextcloud instance under your uh, website and it's easier to share that URL with them because now they don't need to have Tor browser to go there. And for them, maybe they're a bit weirded out yeah. by, oh, what's this Tor browser thing? Now it's That's just, oh, I can just use my normal browser to go there and do something. It's weird. It's slow. It's unreliable. And it's a very necessary censorship resistant fallback, right? To date, we and everyone else have been using Tor as a primary. It really is not a good primary right? The threat model of ClearNet is pretty low. Like you have to be explicitly targeted, right? To, to have your ClearNet domain compromised in any meaningful way. Um, and if it is, then Tor is just sitting right there, right? So having that, that fallback, that escape hatch of Tor, we think will actually act as a deterrent of ClearNet attacks. Because it's like, right. why attack the ClearNet site? All you're going to do is push it into the shadows, right? And then you can't stop that. You can't turn off a website. You can't even denial of service attack an Onion website because Tor has DOS protect, DDoS protection built into the protocol, right? Now, it itself is being denial of service attacked, the entire Tor network. That's a different problem. And, uh, you know, we're we're dealing with that. Uh, it's very painful. But, but yeah, I mean, we, you know, we talk with organizations 
who want to like this is the whole reason of the embassy pro and clearnet it's it's like it's cuz an individual a t- highly not even highly technical your average bitcoiner is going to put up with more inconvenience and weirdness than anyone else in the world for the sake of independence and sovereignty okay we're dealing with a very um slanted market here it's not representative of the rest of the world the rest of the world is not going to do this they are not going to set up tor on their computer and then use v3 addresses to do their self-hosted anything they're just not going to do it so what we're doing is we're pushing uh obviously for the 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 ideal end game of everyone running a personal server but we also recognize that that's probably not realistic ever that in the future you're mostly going to have yes a lot of people running their own server but you're also going to see families running a familial server you're going to see organizations running an organizational server right churches are going to have their own server businesses schools and the people who belong to those organizations or that family are going to use that server right the uncle jim model we think is the real push into the future. And then yes, obviously, if you always ever want to take that next step and become fully sovereign, it's not that hard. You can do it and you can stop using your uncle's server uh, for your needs. But in order for the Uncle Jim model to work, two things had to be true. We needed better computers. Raspberry Pis were never going to cut it if you wanted a hundred of your congregation members to use a server. Uh, and two, Tor. Tor was never going to cut it either. So by beefing up the hardware and going multi-platform and by introducing clearnet support, which is what we're calling the ability to host your embassy and its services on a normal domain, um, we are unlocking the door to organizations and content creators uh, of all sorts. And we think that is the path to grow the technology. And it may also be more viable for you know, let's say businesses or a group of people to let's say, hey, let's all chip in to get one big server That's going fine. rather Cheap. than each yeah. individual person trying to buy their own. Right. So you can see there's a business case there. So in a sense, in some sense, Start9 might uh, start being a little more B2B in some sense. Yeah, it's it's more like, yeah, it's not even B2B necessarily. It's just like organizations using it for themselves. Um for whatever those purposes are. And if you look at some of these organizations today, they're actually getting raked over the coals in terms of SaaS costs, right? Like right. We talked about this on my last- and this is our episode. recent episode where we spoke about how you're, you're able to, let's say this organization is currently paying a lot for Dropbox yeah. or for Slack, you know, yeah, Slack or you know, some kind of yeah. um, Microsoft Office 365. Whereas maybe if we could use Nextcloud instead yeah. and host that, then, hey, we can cut out all this Dropbox cost. And, hey, all of a sudden now, it's a lot cheaper for us to just buy this Embassy Pro device than pay Office, Dropbox, Slack, et cetera. So yeah, I think it's a there, one-time there's, upfront there's, capital cost. Yeah. Yeah, so Instead I think um, this- that's fascinating as well to see. Um, I think one other question I was really curious, uh, and you mentioned earlier, is the, is the bifurcation between Bitcoin oh, yeah. and non-Bitcoin. What are your thoughts? So... I guess uh, setting the table again for listeners. I think Katan's thoughts on this were more like, "Hey, you want it from a they, they you, you might want to have some segregation, have Bitcoin things on one thing and non-Bitcoin things on another." What's your thinking here? I, I think that Bitcoin and non-Bitcoin is the wrong delineation, right? That is the the sort of easy one, and it's sort of the the popular one to say, but that's not actually what they mean. When somebody says you should not run your Bitcoin and non-Bitcoin things on the same box. That's not what they mean. They actually mean two other things. One is your hot and cold infrastructure, right? As in things that are hosting keys that protect money should not be on the same box as things that don't. And number two, what they imply by that statement is that things that are very resource uh, intensive should not be running on the same box as things that maybe don't need a lot of resources. That There's sort of this cross-contamination. And I generally agree with that. If you are going to be running a lot of things and this and running any using any meaningful amount of money right so if, if for instance if you're running five services like bitcoin C, cln you know core lightning and uh, vault warden or nextcloud right like say like those are, that's what you're running so you've got some you know you got bitcoin which is totally cold in most cases unless you're using the the core wallet 
as a, as a hot wallet. Um, and then you've got things that are inherently hot, uh, like core lightning. Um, but the resources aren't going to be an issue. So the second reason for bifurcating goes out the window, right? Resources are not going to be an issue because you're not running a lot of services and say like you only have like $200 worth of Bitcoin on your lightning node. It's also not a big deal if the whole thing goes kabloom, right? Either. So it's like, you don't really need to bifurcate your stuff because your threat model and the disaster scenario just aren't that big or that bad. And so it's like, it's okay, right? Like you don't need to shoot for the ideal, but if you're running 30, 40 services and a good chunk of those things are really resource intensive and other things are holding private keys and are super hot and other things are totally benign, you should probably come up with a strategy of threat mitigation, right? Like, and, and resource um, usage so that your benign things, sorry, your non-resource of intensive things are not getting bogged down by your resource of intensive things. So I don't think that there is like this clear, like you should run these things on one box and these things on another box. It really depends on how many of these things you're running and what they are and what you're using them for. Um, there is unfortunately no just one size fits all do this, which I know is not ideal because people really want that. So here's what we what we um, have been telling our community is if if you want to so hold on let me let me back up for a second here and and state kind of what the what the real threat is like why not put key things on a server and non key things on a different server like why why is why not put them all on the same device the 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 perceived threat here is malware it is cross contamination right it's like i install some new version of uh you know some benign chat app or something like that. Chat could be very private as well. So I'm trying to think of something that like doesn't matter and kind of all matters to an extent. Like you don't want to get hacked on any of these services, but like say like I install some new um, version and it's, it's like malware and we're using Docker for containerization, which affords some degree of sandboxing, right? Like it's, it's pretty good at keeping these things separate. That's kind of the whole point is that they're running in their own little virtual machines um, but we're not going to make a claim that if someone were to build sophisticated malware into one of the services that you install on your device, that it can't access other services. It can. Ultimately, they're, they're on the same metal, okay? Like, they can get to each other. We are building out more sophisticated systems. Like, we don't use Docker Compose. We're not using off-the-shelf Docker stuff to do what we do. We are building a whole new system that is far more sophisticated and featureful and secure than what something like Docker Compose can offer, which is how all these other systems orchestrate their containers. Uh, we're building out a permissions API such that services will not be able to access any other services without the sort of user permission, right? It'll prompt. It'll be like, you've installed LND and it's requesting permission to access these um, you know, uh, parts of Bitcoin, do you approve? And so then you can say yes. Now, if you blindly say yes, and that is malware, then you're still had. Ultimately, you, can, you can't protect the user from themselves. But at the end of the day, the experience will be similar to like an iPhone or Android phone when it says, hey, you've installed this app and it wants these permissions to your device. Do you grant it those permissions? So here's the deal though. So people say run it on different computers because you could end up with some malware of this that infects this thing. And that is absolutely true. But putting them on different machines doesn't really solve that, does it? Because if you have all your Bitcoin stuff running on machine A, right? And by Bitcoin stuff, let's be clear what we mean here. We're talking like Bitcoin, ElectRS, LND, CLN, RTL, Spark, yada, yada, BTC Pay. You've got like this whole stack of services and you're like, oh, I'm super safe because they're all Bitcoin services. Why? What if one of those services in an update is total malware? Your whole system is compromised. The fact that it was Bitcoin or non-Bitcoin didn't really eliminate that threat. It, it just mitigated it by lowering the attack surface, right? So if I'm running 50 services on my device and they're all over the board from Bitcoin to Lightning to non-Bitcoin to storage to messaging, am I more likely to download malware and have my funds stolen? Absolutely. But if I'm running 10 services on a device and they're all Bitcoin only, you haven't eliminated that threat. You've just minimized it, which is a good idea. 
We're not saying not to separate things. We're just saying that this isn't a magic pill. You can't just have a device that's running Bitcoin things and have a device that's running non-Bitcoin things and then just I'm go, I'm safe. You're not. You've you've slightly mitigated a threat. The right way to do this is to make sure that you're downloading trusted software, um, signed appropriately, uh, and and not store your life's fortune on your lightning node. <laughs> of course, right. So let's summarize that then. So uh, in essence, then the argument is not as much about Bitcoin versus not Bitcoin. It's essentially more about whether you are keys hot or keys cold. Um, yes. And as you're saying, around resource intensiveness. Um, um, so probably probably the most important distinction really is just keys hot versus not, you know, because really uh, for if somebody is just running an Electrum server, uh, and all the keys are held, you know, in in like a in a hardware wallet instead. Well, then at least you're not at, you're not that much at risk in terms of losing your coins. Like, okay, maybe there's a privacy you're ratification, right. fine, yeah. but it's not um it's not uh it's not the end of the world uh, compared to if you if your lightning node has like all of your coins on it and it gets pwned. Well, then you're you're just completely out of luck. Our stance is this. If you are a power lightning user with a ton of funds, ton of hot funds on lightning, your server that is running that lightning node should have Bitcoin and lightning on it. Maybe some sort of node management software on top of lightning, like RTL or balance of Satoshi. But again, the fewer the services you have running, it doesn't matter what kind of services there are. It's not Bitcoin versus non-Bitcoin. It's like you want to minimize the attack surface of potential malware installation. So you want as few services running as possible on the node that is managing your money. Maybe that's the right heuristic to think about this. It's like your sensitive things, things that you really don't want someone to have access to, whether it's for privacy reasons or it's you know your data or your money, minimize the number of things running on that device and then put all your sort of less important things maybe on on another device. That might be the right kind of angle to think about this. Yeah, I think that's a good spot to finish up. So um, yeah, great chatting, Matt. Um, I, I think uh, it's, uh, how should I put this? I'll just say it's, it's uh, good to see the community having um, some rigorous back and forth about what kinds of devices we should be using, whether it's Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin uh, applications or self-sovereignty just generally. Um, and uh, listeners, go and find uh, Matt uh, uh, and the team. You can find them over at start9.com. Uh, Matt, uh, I think your Twitter is underscore Matt Hill underscore, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, Matt, uh, anything else you want people to uh, know before we finish up? I don't think so. Okay, fantastic. Just, well, This uh, is not yeah. a settled discussion, right? Like this is a good – I'm glad you had that uh, interview with Katan. I think he's great. I think that he was spot on with everything. Um, it's just that we don't know exactly yet how this is going to evolve. Um, and it's important to keep talking about it. And that's why I wanted to come on. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Our community appreciates it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you.